Uh, okay, everyone, what's up? Goldie here. And I'm going to be going over the good size 11 game main state we have here on uh, Wednesday, July 5. Um, kind of another sort of fishy pitching slate. We've had a couple of these recently. Um, some obvious spots, once again, similar to yesterday, that we could just kind of go after. Um, yeah, well. The one obvious spot, of course, was uh, Kenta Maeda, right, against Royals, 7,100. Um, you know, I talked about how he could be a little trappy there. Well, it turns out that was dead wrong, right? Those uh, those Royal stacks uh, did not pan out very well. You know, that said, um, you know, the Royals get Pablo Lopez today, and that's no real bargain either. Seeing a lot of ownership early in the day here on him. He's certainly the number one. I mean, projection-wise, we got some noise, of course, to, to sort out just yet. Not everybody is, is fully in yet. Um, we'll have these loaded to the site, of course, and and to push to Saverson and all that sort of jazz. Um, but keep an eye out for these numbers to change a little bit uh, early day noise here. That said, I mean, so far, he's six and seven points higher than everybody else on the day. Uh, and, and that makes him the very clear number one. And he gets very clearly the best matchup the, of the day, too. So um, no problems getting to him. We'll get into each one of the games as well. Um, I have to keep an eye on what... Uh, we're frozen in the sheet here. Unbelievable. Uh, I have to keep an eye on what a couple of these couple of these teams are doing um in particular seattle right where are they uh down here in san francisco tonight um i've got tommy malone here in the sheet not totally sure what what we're gonna do they i don't believe i've announced anybody maybe they have uh officially but i've got tommy malone in here um i believe this was bryce miller's spot in the rotation he's gonna be out for a while with a blister uh so they did bring up um, another young arm, Darren McKagan. Uh, I believe DraftKings actually has him in there as opposed to Tommy Tommy Malone. So we got some shenanigans. We got to wait to see what uh, what they want to do later on tonight. Um, no matter, Tommy Malone has is, is really, for the last several years, just been kind of a fill-in piece for them. They actually, earlier in the year, designated him for assignment. So um, in any case... Fishy pitching, but we have a couple of attackable spots that we can get to on the mound. Um, and once again, a lot of arms that we don't really want to play, right? Down here in the in the lower range, some guys that are going to pitch to a lot of contact. And I think we can go after uh, a couple of these spots offensively and get to some really good stacks. Doesn't look like so far that uh, we're going to be overly concentrated. Uh, ownership wise in any one or two spots necessarily you know we don't have a Coors game here or anything like that or that many total trash cans on the mound so I think we're going to be pretty spread out a nice little 11 game tournament slate where you can just play some guys that you like and and run with it um, so that said let's just get into the games Baltimore and the Yankees here first uh, Dean Kramer on the mound for the O's and I want nothing to do with him in this particular matchup, uh, I think the Yankees are a very intriguing tournament stack. Um, now, he's better against right-handers, is Dean, than he is against lefties. The The splits against left-handers are pretty pronounced here. 318 batting average, 398 Wobe, and a 241 ISO. 19% strikeout rate with fly balls at a 43% clip, right? 070 ground ball to fly ball and 39% hard contact. 27% line drive rate. That's a huge, huge number, given that he's already a fly ball pitcher. Two and a half homers per nine with an aggregate 11% barrel rate. Um, no thank you with the Dean Kramer here. I know that the Yankees aren't all that left-handed heavy, but they do have Rizzo, who is not a total corpse. Uh, He's been pretty cold recently, but might start to heat up, and this is a fantastic spot for him. They've got Jake Bowers, like a Billy McKinney, or um, you know whatever the hell else they do with uh, with one of their lefty bench pieces. Um, but some of their righties as well have been heating up. Claver hit a bomb yesterday. They've been leading off DJ again, trying to get him more at bats, and now that he's healthier, um, 
he's still a very high contact hitter, right, and has plenty of upside. He's 3,200 dual eligible in the middle infield. Second and third base, um, that's that's fine, right? Glaber is 48. Stanton hitting the ball hard recently at 4,600. Bader, of course, you can play in the outfield, 37, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, this is a Yankee Stadium against a fly ball pitcher that gives up some hard contact, 35%. He's got a 229 X ISO here in aggregate with a 295 expected batting average allowed and a 375 X Woba. So I want to go after this. I don't want anything to do with Dean Kramer here at 7,700 today uh, against the Yankees. I think they're once again in play, as uh, is Baltimore on the other side. They get Randy Vasquez. He's made just a couple of spot starts for them this season. Uh, 7100 is an intriguing price tag because there's not a lot of guys necessarily in this range. You're super thrilled about playing here today. But Vasquez's numbers in the upper minors are pretty dreadful. And as a matter of fact, few of these guys from the Orioles have seen him in the upper minors, notably Jordan Westberg, Colton Kowser is a high upside hit tool that they just called up. Um, and another young bat like a Gunnar Henderson has seen Randy as well. Um, so I think these guys are very much playable. They've got a little bit of history against Randy, and Randy's numbers in the upper minors are pretty dreadful. He's got, I believe, an ERA north of 5, XFIP in that same range, right? He's suppressed pretty okay in his first couple outings. Uh, that were just spot starts here in the bigs. Um, hasn't really been up in a while. Let's see, his last appearance was... Uh, about a full month ago against the White Sox, went five and two-thirds. He was fine there. Didn't really strike out anybody, but didn't suppress any, uh, or didn't give up any runs, rather. Suppressed pretty well. And then at the uh, end of May, he got the Padres, went four and two-thirds, struck out six. So has displayed a little bit of K stuff. Um, you know, not super impressive or anything like that. I think I'll probably just leave him on the shelf. This is a super dangerous offense to be going after with – what seven lefties they'll probably have in the in the top seven guys here. Uh, they might even have a full eight lefties now that they've got uh, Colton Kowser that they brought up from uh, AAA. So he's stone two thousand men. If you want to play that as a cheap outfield piece, I think that's fine. And you can play any of the other um, you know top six. I'm not super thrilled about the price tags here necessarily. Uh, for Baltimore, but that makes him a very intriguing tournament stack. They're a little bit down the board for me, uh, simply due to the pricing. Probably a couple of other offenses I think I'd rather get to, um, but in a upside spot for all of this offense here, you know, Vasquez is an average to a slightly below average arm. He's had trouble throwing strike one here. No chase in him at just 25-26% aggregate you know 94 percent strength whatever i mean this is only two starts but i think he is in for uh, a little bit of an awakening because his first two starts in or his spot starts into bigs this season have been serviceable so it's a, a difficult spot for him and i think i would like to try and get to as much baltimore as i can um you know gunner at 47 this is fine i like that they're leading him off now and have moved Cedric down to the five to give all the other guys a little bit of protection. Uh, Rutch, Santander, and O'Hearn at the two, three, four. They're all expensive up there outside of O'Hearn. He's 37. That's fine. Lost his outfield eligibility, so it's sole first base now for him, which is unfortunate. But you could play the cheap guys like an Aaron Hicks if you want. Um, maybe he's going to have his Yankees revenge game or something like that. Who knows? But I prefer Colton Cowser. He's a far better hit tool, and he's 2,000. So uh, I like getting two game stacks here if we can make this happen because I think they're cheap enough, the Yankees in particular on the other side, that you could still get up to like Pablo Lopez or uh, Justin Steele or something like that. So I think that's how I'd like to approach that game. Offense mostly, um, or pretty much exclusively, no pitching for me. Graham Ashcraft for the Reds in Washington tonight against JoJo in the Nationals. Uh, 6100 for Ashcraft. Now, I really like this price tag for, for Graham, but... The problem with him is mostly the arsenal here. Now, he is, he is, for most of his career, he's main just a cutter, and that has really yielded a lot of power to same-handed hitters. Right? We talked about this before, that the cutter is not a pitch that you can go to work with against same-handed hitters. 
because unless your location is elite, we'll actually get to Justin Steele and talk about his cutter. They These two guys have very similar arsenals, right? Cutter, slider. And that's really all they go to work with. Um, the difference here is Graham Ashcraft, his location to right-handers with the cutter, since he throws it so often, it, it leaves quite a bit on the table. And what happens is he starts at middle third of the plate, and it tails over the over the barrel, and that's what leads to all of the hard contact and power issues to the right side. He pitches to a full 293 batting average so far this year, 371 Woba and 195 ISO, with just a 15% strikeout rate. Cutter is not a whiff pitch. He doesn't induce whiffs with the slider either. And when he throws the cutter so much, it's 39% hard contact to the right-handers, and that's you know that leads to a one and a half homers per nine. He does get ground balls, which is attractive, right? And that's what the cutter is. It's a it's a ground ball and a, a rollover type of pitch, soft contact type of pitch. And the cutter slider combo will keep him down in the strike zone. So that's what makes him serviceable and what kind of would attract me at this particular price tag. This is a difficult matchup against Washington. However, batted ball wise, since he's going to induce so many ground balls here, I mean, in aggregate, the Nationals hit 150 ground balls per fly ball. Uh, this is a dreadful offense. They don't strike out a lot, but they don't walk. They don't hit for any power or make any hard contact and hit so many ground balls. So I think that actually has to put Graham Ashcraft in play here. Unfortunately for him, you know, he does give up a little bit of production to the left side as well. So the cutter is not just elite against the lefties, which would totally put me on to him. But he does still induce 1.8 ground balls per fly ball. He's a little bit more susceptible in a traditional type of platoon split there, however. Um... Uh, as you can see here, this is really where the cutter starts to shine. It's the hard contact suppression at 22%. Increased soft contact rate up, upwards of 19% as well, but he does give up a, some line drives and a little bit of power on occasion with some batting average. So, you know, by no stretches is, is Ashcraft like super attractive down here. I do like the matchup. If you get all the way down here, like there are a couple of pretty expensive offenses that we might want to play today. If you get all the way down here and need this, I think he is in play for six innings. He does still have a lot of ELO, and he has introduced at least a third pitch. Coming into the season, he was just a cutter-slider guy. Um, but he has introduced a little bit more of the sinker, which is unfortunately, you know, against lefties, not a good pitch, also not a swing-and-miss pitch. So that's why we see just a 17% aggregate strikeout rate. Uh, so I'm not super thrilled about playing Ashcraft, but I do think there is some upside for him at 6,100 in this particular matchup because he induces so many ground balls. So I think he's in play due to that. But we, of course, have upside concerns on a full 11-game slate. JoJo on the other side at 8,100. I'm also kind of concerned with upside here as well. Um, JoJo still got a little bit of a, a control problem and, and walking some guys. It's not overly... Um, you know, uh, solved for him just yet. Now, he has fixed, as we talked about many times this season with JoJo, the hard contact issues that he was exhibiting last season. He induces a lot of soft contact now and gets some ground balls to the right side. So he's no longer just giving up baseballs over the wall. He's really fixed that. Um, hasn't quite figured out the control just yet, and he's sacrificed a lot of that swing and miss stuff that he used to have in order to just not give up so much production and it's mostly worked for him 330 era this year with a 465 xfip perhaps a little bit of negative regression coming to him and this is not really the matchup i want to be playing jojo necessarily um against the reds this is a pretty sticky offense over here man i mean friedel's been really really good recently of course mclean india ellie de la cruz jake fraley jake uh, joey Votto, spencer steer it, i mean these guys are very difficult to get through. This is a hard lineup, and these numbers are going to continue to tick up. 98 WRC plus. It's really not moving, but it's only because we got such a large sample here uh, so far. But by the end of the season, you could probably see this at a buck 08 or something like that. Would not be surprised if this offense continues to hum like it has been recently over the last uh, month or so since they brought Ellie up. Overall. The numbers are not super attractive and super impressive, but they're going to tick up now and continue to with Fraley, Friedel, and Ellie here from the left side of the plate, as well as Joey Votto back. The walk rate's certainly going to continue to tick up too. 
Um, so this is a very dangerous, hard lineup to get through. At 8,100, I think his upside is, is really capped, to be quite honest. Now, he'll give up some fly balls to the left side, and that's what really would take me off here. It's very warm in Washington tonight, uh, pushing 90 degrees, I believe, and this ballpark plays up offense a lot when it's warm. So with some walks and some fly balls and um, and line drives a little bit to the left side here, I mostly want to stay off of JoJo. I wouldn't be surprised if he survives because I don't really want to play the Reds necessarily. They're all super expensive. 47 for uh, Friedel, 54 for McLean, 47 for India, 6,000 for Ellie, 52 for Fraley, and 51 for Joey Votto. I mean, Spencer Steer in the seven hole is 4,900 also. Tyler Stevenson is 46. We're almost in, like, Braves and Texas territory with this team now. So super difficult to get there with stacks. They're down the board. In that respect, their ownership is going to be way down, but their value scores in aggregate so far here are actually relatively high. I think it's a sneaky spot for their offense, and you can get to them. Um, not a favorite stack necessarily for me because of the price tags. I just, like, if I'm paying this much, I'd probably prefer to just get to Texas or get to Atlanta or whatever, or the Dodgers. Um, but that very well puts Cincinnati in play. So I'm going to leave JoJo on the shelf here today. I have upsides concerns at this particular price tag. Okay, let's move on. Here is Atlanta. Uh, Mike Soroka on the mound for them, 6,700. Now, you could play him. He's another one of these cheaper arms down in the uh, you know sub-7K range that if you need to get to an expensive correlated stack, for example, he could be in play here. He's not a strikeout guy. He never really has been. Um, but he's got four pitches that he can work with. And his last outing... Um, Maybe not his last outing. Could have been the outing before that. Um, no, it was his last outing. He came back and, and got Miami, went six innings, struck out seven, did give up three runs. And in his two starts um, before that, the, prior to that this season, got Arizona, gave up five runs. Got Oakland, gave up four runs earlier in the year. Um, you know, After he came back, I guess this was, what, a, about a month or so ago. Um, in those first two outings. In any case, not a strikeout pitcher is Soroka. And this is not a strikeout team, not a strikeout matchup, of course, against Cleveland. However, um, we have to keep an eye out for Josh Naylor. He tweaked his wrist, I believe, yesterday. So, like, their second best hitter is probably not going to be in the lineup here tonight. And so where's, like, he's one of the only guys outside of Josie Ramirez that actually has power to hit the baseball over the wall. Um so I don't want to play any Cleveland here. Like, it's just going to be a contact game that they're going to have to play to really score a lot of runs against Soroka. And I think they're pretty unlikely to be able to do that. They hit so many ground balls, very similar to Washington. Buck 30 ground ball to fly ball here. They create a little bit more because they have guys with more speed and they steal more bases. And they have Jose Ramirez. But outside of that, they don't hit for any power here. They don't strike out. Average walk rate, no hard contact, right? There's just a well below. Our, we've been talking about Cleveland and their and their numbers against everybody uh, all season. So they're very attackable with a respectable arm. It's not like Soroka is a zero on the mound. He can survive for sure, but we need more chase out of him if we're going to start to really get thrilled about playing outsized exposures necessarily. So I'm not super thrilled about it, but he's in play at 6,700, I think. Um, probably expect a, a middling sort of 15 to 18 point out. He might pop for like 20, 22 or whatever because he's very likely to get run support against Cal Quantrill. Um, 5,600 for him, I think, is a total non-starter. He has a 12% strikeout rate and an 8% walk rate. You cannot do this against Atlanta. You have to have guys that can induce swing and miss. He only has a 25% chase rate, 7.5% swinging strikes with a 21% CSW. This is a total non-starter. Um, you know, the price agnostic, Atlanta is absolutely the best stack of the day, I think. There's not, like, a ton of total trash cans that we will really want to go after on the mound here necessarily. Um, and, and, you know, Cal Quantrill's not necessarily that either, right? He's got six pitches that he goes to work with. It's just that, like, he's a pitcher, and he tries to induce soft contact and ground balls and sequence well. Um, but unfortunately for him, he gets Atlanta, and, this, like, you just cannot go after this offense right now. They are, it's every single one of them. 
Ozzy hit two bombs yesterday. Michael Harris from the nine hole hit two bombs the day before. Um, it, like it, it's every one of them. Acuna's up to 6,700 now. Like I think he's still underpriced for the upside that the guy offers. Uh, to be quite honest, I think he should be 7,000. Ozzy is 57. Austin Riley, I guess price adjusted at 5,600 is probably your best play of the top guys here. But he's 5,600. You know they, these guys are not cheap. If you can make Brave stacks happen, you're gonna have to punt on the mound. Soroka is one of the guys that can get you there, as is Graham Ashcraft that we talked about. Um. You know, so it's going to be difficult once again to make Brave Stacks happen, but they have all the upside in the world. I think what I'd prefer to do is, I mean, full stacks are obviously in play here because Quantrill's going to pitch to an 84% contact rate. That is not a recipe for success against Braves. Uh, like, they're just totally deadly top to bottom. 218 ISO with this kind of sample size through half of the season is out of control. It's just off the charts good. Buck 18 WRC plus. Now this has ticked up like 12 ticks over the last like month. 37% hard. I mean, it's just every single number is fantastic. You're going to have to play some of these guys down at the bottom. If you get to full stacks, uh, just cause you can't make it happen. Otherwise, um, I think I would probably prefer short stacks of the Braves just because of the pricing. It's a little bit easier to get to a cheaper secondary stack or a primary stack. Um, and then mix in the three expensive guys like an Acuna, Riley, Matt Olson, or, or whatever. Like, pick and choose any of these guys at the top. Um, you know, I don't want to pay 57 for Ozzy Albies or anything like, you know, or 64 for Matt Olson necessarily, but it's kind of hard to argue against it, you know. Um, they've been that good over the last month and a half. Um, so it's, it's still just price tags. Uh, a lot of the upside is priced in at these numbers. But uh, when they're streaking like this, I mean, it's very hard to ignore them. If you don't have any Atlanta exposure, you could very well get blown out uh, by 730 Eastern. And it's just like, okay, the night's over because they hit three bombs in the first inning. Um, That said, when they don't hit the ball over the wall, they don't create otherwise. So you do take that risk when you pay these kinds of price tags for them. So something to keep in mind. Uh, that said, they are still the top stack of the day and no pitching outside of some Soroka pieces here in correlated stacks, um, but really not thrilled with the pitching really at all. Um, Josie Ramirez, if you want to play him, sure. He's 5,800, uh, but I'd rather just play Austin Riley on the other side at 56. Okay, let's move on. Texas and Boston. John Gray, I think he's too expensive here. Um, now, I have played him at more expensive price tags this season. have talked about playing him a little bit. I don't like this matchup for him necessarily. Uh, I think there's other guys in the same range I'd rather play today in better matchups. And I think we need to see a little bit more of a price reduction on John Gray back down into the low 8K, 7K sort of range before we start getting super excited about playing him again in bad matchups. And Boston is still a bad matchup, just 21.5% strikeout rate for them, 170 ISO. They've cooled off quite a bit recently. Um, but this is an okay spot for them to kind of jump on to John Gray. He's still giving a pop to the lefties this season, 168 ISO, just a 22% strikeout rate. So he's pitching to more contact this year, even though it's only 76% in on, in aggregate. Um, the strikeout stuff isn't there necessarily. Just a neutral ground ball to fly ball, not inducing near as many ground balls as we'd like to see with this sort of strikeout rate. He's elite with the strike one still at 69%. Great chase at 33, 34% or whatever. Uh, That's all fine, but his last several outings have not been good. And John Gray is a streaky pitcher. That's why I say I would much prefer to get him at far cheaper price tags uh, due to the variance that he he brings along with him. Uh, His last three starts have been terrible uh, after he dealt with the blister. And the six starts before that, when he was at cheaper price tags were fantastic. So he's super streaky and he is streaking to the downside right now. And at at this particular number, 8,900, I'd like to stay off of him against Boston. I would like to get to some Boston sacks. If I can make that happen, Yoshida got a price drop today, 4,800 starting to get a little bit more attractive there. Jaron Duran still 28, Alex Verdugo 4,000, and Rafi Devers is 4,900. So I like getting to some of these lefties here, including Tristan Casas. 23 for him now uh, is far more playable. John Gray much less likely to blow it past him. Um, now, it's not batting average that John Gray is necessarily going to give up, so hard to get there 
with full stacks, I think you probably just want a homer hunt uh, or maybe get to some short stacks with guys that don't strike out, like a Verdugo and Rafi Devers, Yoshida type. Uh, I think that's a fine playable three-man. If you mix in Jaron Duran because he's cheap or Tristan Casas because he's cheap, go ahead. Uh, I think that's okay, but it's going to har- be hard because John Gray still doesn't walk a ton of people necessarily, and he stays off the barrel for the most part. Um, I just have upside concerns for him at this particular price because he's not striking out a lot of guys. So not super thrilled to get, get after Boston today. Um, value-wise, they're popping pretty hard, as a matter of fact, so far here in the early going. So we'll have to see what happens with the projections later on. And if their ownership stays pretty uh, manageable here, I think they're a very viable stack because, you know, we, we're really just getting a price inversion on, pro, on uh, Rafi Devers as opposed to Josh Young on the other side of the game at 5000 right? So I'd much rather play Boston stacks. It, the guys that you want to play here for Boston as opposed to Texas – um, are more attainable price-wise than everybody for the Rangers here getting Brian Bale on the mound at 8500 I'm also kind of concerned strikeout-wise with him at this particular price tag. And this is a horrible matchup. I'm just not playing guys against Texas uh, unless they've got elite whiff stuff. Now, Brian Bayo does have good ground ball stuff. He's gotten a lot more ground balls this year and sacrificed all of the K stuff that he had earlier in the, his upper minors career. Um Mains a sort of sinker, kind of slider change mix here. Does mix in a good bit of the four-seamer as well. So he's very equitable arsenal-wise, and that, that's made him very serviceable this season. 85, though, in this in this matchup, I, I need a far cheaper price tag and a more strikeout upside uh, on a full slate to consider really going after Texas. So I'm going to leave him on the shelf here today as well. I don't really want to go after him, though, either, necessarily. He doesn't give up a lot of batting average, similar to John Gray. He's very good against right-handers, 27% K rate there. It's the left-handed strikeout rate at 16% that I'm concerned with. Lower ground ball to fly ball ratio there as well, compared to the righties at 241. He's at just about buck sixty-five or so against the lefties. So that puts the left-handers in play most notably Corey Seager and um, you know Jonah Heim from the left side of the plate. Nate Lowe, price adjusted, is the best play of the three, but Corey Seager is very clearly the best hitter of the three. Um, and Jonah Heim's 4,800 now, so you yikes. So I don't really want to be playing a lot of Texas necessarily, but they're going to be totally off the board. Um, you know, if you're playing a very expensive stack, it's Atlanta that you really want to get to, which brings in Texas to play, of course. Uh, this is still a super dangerous offense, and they could put up a 10 spot against anybody in baseball. And this game's in Fenway. So with lower strikeout rates for both of these pitchers, I'm going to leave them on the shelf uh, personally today. And I would like to try and get to some offense, but it's mostly going to be short stacks and, and filler pieces, I think, because I'm not crazy about full price tags here for Bo- or for uh, Texas. I'd be much more attracted full stack-wise to Boston. Okay, let's move on. Kansas City and the Twins. Alec Marsh on the mound for the Royals here today. I'm going to leave him on the shelf, too. Um, Just made his debut against the Dodgers, right? And that was not uh, (laughs) an excellent spot to be putting in, uh, putting a a young pitcher in, right? Walked four batters, gave up whatever, five, six runs or something, um, five runs in, in four innings. So I'm going to probably just leave him on the shelf again today. Now, the Twins, who knows what they're going to do with their lineup. Um, and they kind of made me look like a jackass yesterday for saying that Zach Greinke was in play. Um, well, the guy got hurt, though, so I I was I was right up until that point, right? No. In any case, um, I don't think Alec Marsh is, is really in play here. He's got a, a nice arsenal split here, you know, three-pitch mix. But I want to see more out of him before I start just going after everybody in baseball. Um, you know, the Twins are a totally different matchup than the Dodgers, of course. And he's 5,000, right? Twins are going to strike out against everybody. So that would put him in play. But he only threw 50% strike one, really battled the control in that first start. Uh, so I want to see more out of him. If I get beat by a $5,000 arm in his second start of the year against the Twins... On an 11-game slate, then I just probably get beat. I think you can get right back to twin and, twin stacks um, and play correlated teams with Pablo Lopez, but they're going to be pretty popular once again because they're all very cheap still. 
Eddie Juliana, I do love this play at uh, second base, 3,000, likely be up at the top of the lineup. Alex Kirilov, also super cheap, 2,700 for him, 28 for Max Kepler. Joey Gallo, I really, really like this play at 3,300. Doesn't look like Alec Marsh is going to be able to throw it past anybody. Um, not a, a ton of velocity from him, but just 95 in the fastball. Not an excellent velo delta on the changeup either so far here. It's just, uh, you know, seven miles an hour or so. Need a little bit more, um, you know, that could play against the Twins, of course. But uh, I'd like to see this upwards of, of nine and ten miles an hour to get really thrilled about it. But a good four-pitch mix here, and that could certainly put him in play at 5,000 against the Twins who are bad. Um, maybe heating up a little bit because they've had some good matchups. This is probably another pretty good matchup for them, I would think. Everybody playable for them uh, in stacks, but you're going to have to balance a little bit of ownership there. Pablo on the mound for them, as I mentioned at the outset, he is the number one here. The projection delta so far is just way too high compared to everybody else on the slate. Um, and uh, the ownership is really following, right? He's pushing 40% now, but the value score is off the charts here. Uh, I think this is a fantastic spot. He gets ahead so efficiently at 71% strike one that it's really hard to uh, make it an argument for a lot of the Royals uh, in this matchup. He's got a 30% K rate, 35% chase, 15% swing strike rate nearly at 30% CSW. If anything, we might see the strand rate tick up for him into a more you know, standard range for this kind of plate discipline. He's only at, he's at sub 70% in the strand rate so far. We might even see a little bit of positive regression for him in the suppression metrics. Four, four and a quarter ERA here with an XFIP about three quarters of a run lower. XERA, a full run lower. So good five pitch mix here um, has brought in the, the sweeper, really getting value out of the change up to this season. Um, two really good pitches here, and I think the Royals are going to swing and miss a crap load in this particular matchup. So I'd love to get to him. He doesn't have a real targetable weakness necessarily. Um, if anything, it's some fly balls to the lefties, but the hard contact is very much under control, and he still induces a lot of swing and miss there, right? 30% aggregate carry. It's really to both sides. It's 25% to the lefties here. So, yeah, give me all the Pablo, um, and I'm probably just going to leave the Royals on the shelf here. Maybe a a lefty hedge piece or leverage piece like a Kyle Isbell or something. He's got a little bit of speed. Uh, Michael Massey is healthy again. So that's nice to see Nick Prado perhaps. And you can always play Salvi. However, with elite chase here, that's really Salvi's problem. I'm going to stay off of that. And Bobby Witt's still 4,800. So not interested overly there uh, for really any of these guys. I'd probably just like chase with a cheap piece, um, Kyle Isbell or Michael Massey or Nick Prado or something like that. Okay, let's move on to Toronto and the White Sox. Uh, Josie Barrios on the mound for the Blue Jays. This is an intriguing spot for him, I think. Uh, I think he's one of these guys in this 9K range that we could consider today. If we can't get all the way up to Pablo or Justin Steele, who we'll get to, uh, I think Barrios is, is very much in play. Um, this is a good matchup for him. He's fantastic against right-handers. 212 batting average, 273 WOBA, and a 130 ISO here with... Unfortunately, just a 21% strikeout rate. So the slider really not providing all the swing and miss that we have seen historically from him. But he's very efficient early in the count this season, not walking really anybody. Better strikeout stuff to the left side, as a matter of fact. And that's really with the change that he's induced to swing and miss with. 63% um, strike one and decent chase here, 31%, 32%. CSW for him hovering around 30%. So all good for Josie this year. Really gotten the hard contact and split uh, or, you know, downside of the platoon numbers under control when he was dreadful against lefties last year. Still giving up a little bit of pop, 182 ISO and a 273 batting average. So if you want to get to a couple White Sox pieces, it would only be a lefty here. I don't want to deal with any of the right handers, even though they're not going to strike out a hell of a lot. They're kind of overpriced for this particular matchup or they have a bad batted ball matchup like. A Tim Anderson, for example, it's not that he's overpriced. It's just that he hits so many ground balls, doesn't really have a lot of power necessarily. Uh, Eloy Jimenez, a lot of ground balls from him as well, and he's not the greatest 4,500 price tag either. I don't want to touch Jake Berger. I want Andrew Vaughn more so against left-handers. And Luis Robert, the, really their best fly ball power hitter, he's unfortunately 5,600 and kind of a down matchup. So 
he would be the only righty I play if I played a righty. And some of these lefties here, I don't really want to deal with. Benintendi doesn't have a lot of upside. Um, you know, Oscar Colas doesn't have a lot of upside necessarily. You know, he does at 2,200, but he's going to be in the eight hole uh, on a home team. You know, I don't really want to do that. Like, I'd rather play a much higher upside Colton Kowser, 200 cheaper on an away team um, at Yankee Stadium than Oscar Colas at guaranteed rate uh, in Chicago tonight, for example. So um, I think Joey, Josie is in play here. We probably have some upside concerns at 9,200. Um, over here on DK, ignore this FanDuel price. This is wrong. Uh, so I think he's he's very much in play going after the White Sox. This team is still bad, right? Let's do just an 87 WRC plus here. They don't walk, and they strike out at an average clip. Very little power, sub-30% hard contact, a lot of ground balls. So uh, I think that plays into Josie's hands here a little bit with the sinker slider combo against very righty-heavy lineups. Hard contact, not really an issue. Uh, to the right side, uh, really, or to the left side, as a matter of fact, but the line drives, he'll give up a little bit to the lefties, so it would be lefties that are my favorite outside of a Luis Robert, maybe a one-off there, but um, mostly just Josie here. I think he's very much in play. Lance Lynn is in play, too, 8,400. He's elite against right-handers, right? 209 batting average, 284 Woba, and a 143 ISO allowed this year, giving up a little bit of power there, but, like, whatever. He's got a 30% strikeout rate against right-handers. 32% hard contact, it's good. It, it's good because he throws so many fastballs. Doesn't really have all that much in the in the secondary arsenals here, uh, or arsenal, I should say, with secondary pitches. Only has about 18% that he uses here between, you know, split pretty evenly between the change in the slider and a little bit of a show-me curveball. Um, he's mostly a fastball guy, as he has been for the last several seasons. He's elite early in the count, 67% strike one. His main problem this year has been the left-handers. This is like a Chris Bassett type of split. Type of split. 345 batting average allowed, 442 Woba, and a 310 ISO. He still has a little bit of swing and miss there, uh, but he's got no 85 ground ball to fly ball with a 25% line drive rate and a 38% hard contact rate. It's barrels to the left side. So much loud contact that makes him mega attackable. But unfortunately for Toronto, they're also very right-handed heavy. They've got three lefties that they'll probably throw at him, maybe a fourth if they throw in like Cap Biggio or something. Brandon Belt, I do think this is very playable here. He's got dual eligibility at first base in the outfield now. So that now you can play both him and Vladdy Guerrero. If I'm playing a right-hander, it would probably be Vladdy at 4800 I like the price tag, and he's really heating up over the last 10, 15 days or so. Um, I like that a good bit. So you can play both of them. And you can also play Varsho or Kevin Kevin Kiermaier or something like that. Um, maybe a Kevin Biggio. He's cheap, and he hits a lot of fly balls. Um, and Lance Lynn gives it up to everybody. Too many fly balls here and too much hard contact in the air for uh, for him against left-hander. So Dalton Varsho at 3,300, he's in play. If you want to get to a full Toronto stack, I think that's in play. Um, would probably start with like a, a belt Vladdy. I run a Matt Chapman as well. I'd want some fly ball hitters from the right side if I play any of them. Um, and I'm not super jacked about Boba Shedd or, or George Springer necessarily from the right side. So I'd probably prefer Matt Chapman there. Um, I'm going to stay off of Whit because I think he stinks. Finally, they moved him down to the you know bottom half of the lineup against right-handers. Um, so I think I'd like to stick to maybe the middle of the lineup if I go after Lance Lynn here. And I think that's viable, getting some Toronto. They're deadly against right-handed pitching in general. It's a difficult spot. I think both sides, or pretty much everybody, is in play here outside of most of the White Sox. Uh, I like Josie. I like Lance Lynn a little bit for some exposure at their particular price tags. I think there's some upside that we can capitalize on. Um, and certainly Toronto, because Lance Lynn, when he gets blown up, uh, he can get blown up pretty good and give up a real crooked number. Okay, Chicago and Milwaukee. Here's Justin Steele. We talked about him earlier, or alluded to him earlier with the Graham Ashcraft Arsenal comparison. Here's the cutter slider for him as well. Now, he doesn't throw near as much of a sinker. Um, his, the difference here between his cutter and Ashcraft's is that his location is far, far better. Uh, he induces a lot more swing and miss to same-handed hitters. Now, we got a short sample on him here this season, but last year he exhibited a, a decent bit of swing and miss as well against same-handed hitters. Um, 
his slider is better than Ashcraft's too. So that's where a lot of the swing and miss is coming from. And when he uses this cutter, he starts at middle or he starts at, um, you know, over the middle third of the plate and it tails over the outside third, as opposed to Ashcraft who starts over the inner third and it tails over the middle third, right? So that's how you end up with hard contact and barrels to same handed hitters with this cutter in particular. But Something to keep in mind here, even though this is a lefty against Milwaukee, he does just have two pitches. So if he's going to get blown apart, well, I mean, Milwaukee's only got two pitches they got a zero in on here. They're still going to swing and miss a lot. Maybe not so much from the right side of the plate, so that could put them in play. But they're going to hit some ground balls here, too. I mean, the, the soft contact for with this cutter... Uh, for Steele against right-handers is at 25%. He's got a hard contact rate against righties at 17%. That's a an elite split. This is one of the better number, one of the better splits in baseball, soft to hard contact ratio. Uh, buck 65 ground ball to fly ball to the righties too. So he's inducing ground balls and soft contact against right-handers. So I don't really want to play a lot of the Brewers. I think. Th- they're less likely to strike out a hell of a lot in this particular matchup, but they're more likely to just roll over balls because they've got a buck 50 ground ball to fly ball ratio themselves against lefties, similar to Washington and Cleveland and and the White Sox. You know, just no creation here whatsoever, no power, no real hard contact to speak of. That's an average figure at 32.5% and a lot of strikeouts, 28% there. So. I think Justin Steele, if you are looking for a pivot off of Pablo Lopez, not that you necessarily need one, but if you're chalky a little bit in the batter's box and you're looking for a pivot and you've got an extra 200 bucks, I think Justin Steele is very much in play here. Um, He's expensive. Let's not get get it confused. Way more than I would prefer to be playing, prefer to be paying for him, I should say. you know, I'd like him in the in the nine Ks or something in this matchup, where I think there's a lot more upside to really capitalize on. But he certainly has 30 in the tank here. He could go seven innings, strike out six or or even a full K an inning, and just blast through the Brewers here. They are awful against left-handed pitching. Not the nec- not the matchup necessarily that I'm looking for a bounce for them. Um, they just haven't shown anything a full half of the season in, and uh, I don't, you know, at least in this matchup, I think that's pretty unlikely to change. Adrian Hauser on the mound for the Brewers, 6,500. Intriguing price tag, however, uh, you know, against the Cubs. They're just a an average to below average offense against right-handed pitching. Average K rate, average creation in 95 WRC plus here. No hard contact for them either. A lot of ground balls. So that would put him in play because he does induce a lot of ground balls to the right side. Two and a half ground balls per fly ball against righties. Another really, really strong soft to hard contact ratio. It's a little inverted here in that he gives up more hard, but it's only 5% more, right? Still just 26% here versus 21% soft contact. His split is far more pronounced against lefties, closer to like the Lance Lynn territory. 293 average allowed, 373 Woba, 200 ISO, 14% strikeout rate. 11.5% 11.5% walk rate, et cetera, et cetera, with 36% hard against the lefties. So that's how we want to go after Hauser here. He pitches to 86, 87% contact. I would like to get to some of the Cubs, but it's not really any of the righties unless it's a very high fly ball hitter. And from the right side, they don't really have that necessarily. Maybe a Dansby Swanson uh, or something like that, Chris Morrell, but he's 4,900 now. And against right-handers, they shove him down at the bottom of the lineup. So I'd like to play a couple of these lefty pieces if I can. Mike Talkman, nobody ever plays him, and he's 2,800 still leading off. Um, Ian Happ at 39, very playable price tag there still. I really like Cody Bellinger here at 4,500, even though he's been cold ever since he got hurt. I like that. And uh, Jared Young, cheap first base play at 2,800 if you want to play that as well. I think that's fine going after Adrian Hauser. But probably hard to get there with stacks. With the Cubs, because he gets so many ground balls, Hauser against right-handers. You know, 301 batting average, he'll pitch to, pitch to some average, but an 088 ISO. Um, it's just super hard to to string together a lot of uh, real production. If you want to throw in a righty, it would be Nico. I'd probably stay off of Seiya, even though he is 3,500. He's dealing with a sore neck and hasn't really seen a lot of uh, live game action recently. So um, the price tag has to put him in play if you get to that in stacks, but... Um, you know, not as a one-offer and really not 
my favorite play in stacks if I got to play righty anyway. So a little bit of the Cubs, no Brewers for me here tonight. Um, even at cheap price tags, I don't want to deal with these guys. I respect Justin Steele, and I really like this cutter. It's a very good pitch against right-handers, uh, and I don't want to deal with Yelich, who strikes out a lot against lefties, so no thanks. Okay, let's move on. Angel San Diego. Um, Patty Sandoval, it, like he's serviceable, right? At 6,900, he gets a lot of ground balls too. But this is a terrible matchup, I think, strikeout-wise. He only has 18% Ks in the tank. And against left-handers, the Padres up at the top of the lineup, they're super difficult to get through. Hassan Kim doesn't strike out a lot. He's been great recently. Fernando Tatis, of course. Soto doesn't strike out. Machado, of course, at 52 is a really good third base play. I think today, Xander Bogarts at 5,000, also really good numbers against lefties. Very difficult to get through. Much more attackable are the Padres with right-handers than left-handers, and we certainly like guys that can't throw it past them. Patty, not necessarily one of them, even though he is going to induce some ground balls. So against the right side, um, you know, the numbers aren't super attackable necessarily. You know, pretty good. He'll pitch just some batting average, which I think puts some... Padres in play, notably like a Ha-Sung Kim, Manny Machado, Xander Bogarts. You can always play Tatis, of course, and the same with Soto, but Soto in a downside of a platoon uh, at 5,900 when he's probably going to hit some ground balls here. It's a little questionable at that particular price tag, but um, now I like the Padres here a little bit, pretty down the board, I think, in terms of a top stack, but uh, very much playable, very much in play in tournaments, uh, a couple of interesting pieces, notably Machado and Bogarts, Hassan Kim there. And, of course, you can always play Tatis. So a nice little four-man, maybe, if you want to go after Patty. I generally don't, but, um, you know, 6,900, I think he's a little bit too expensive in this particular matchup because we're lacking upside, really. Seth Lugo on the mound for the Padres. Yeah, I think in this range... I think he's very much in play. we got to keep an eye on what the Angels are going to do. Otani had to come out yesterday because of a blister now on his, I believe his throwing hand, um, his right hand, that may be preventing him from being able to hit. They did pinch hit for him late, and they brought in um, uh, Joe Adele, I believe. So if they do that again tonight, that puts Lugo very much in play because they're without Trout. They're without Anthony Rendon, who fouled the ball off his leg and got hurt again yesterday. Um, and they may very well be without Otani. So, like, the their 2-3-4 three, hitter, 3-4-5 three, hitters, whatever, uh, are now they mer- very well may, easy for me to say, uh, be out of the lineup. So now you've got Mickey Moniak, who's been great, don't get me wrong, uh, Taylor Ward, who's been fine, but after that you got Moustakas, who's not overly impressive, um, Hunter Renfro, he's really been cold over the last little while, and we kind of know what we get with Hunter Renfro. Then you got Matt Theis, Renjifo, Eddie Escobar, David Fletcher, really low upside generally for the rest of this lineup outside of like a a Moniac and Hunter Renfro. Like they're missing Brandon Drury too, you know? So this, this team is dealing with a lot of injuries over here, and I think that could very well put Lugo in play. Fishy high... I call it fishy, but it's like suspiciously high, curiously high projection for Seth Lugo because Seth Lugo is not overly impressive generally, right? 20% K rate to the right side, which is not all that excellent because he's got a curveball. But he does have 24% strikeouts to the left side. and They'll probably platoon here um, even if they are missing Otani. They still have, you know, five lefties or even six lefties that they might be able to throw in the lineup. So... Uh, I think overall, this is an attackable spot for Lugo at a playable price tag. That's probably why he's seeing a good bit of ownership here, 20% 20 give or take so far. 30 in the value score is fine for somebody in this range. Uh, I think this has to put him in play, especially if Otani is out. Um, That would put me way more onto onto way more Lugo. But even currently with Otani in there... Uh, without Trout, without Rendon, Otani doesn't have any protection. Like, they're going to put Mike Boustakis in the four hole or whatever, you know what I mean? And Hunter Renfro. So, it's not the greatest. You just got to get through Otani. And I think with a 24% K rate and just a buck 60 ISO allowed, he can still do that, even though this is Otani. Uh, so, they might give him a day off because they need him in the rotation, Otani. They also, of course, need him in the, in the lineup. But 
Uh, they do still need him in the rotation. He's got the blister. He's got the cracked fingernail that he's dealing with, et cetera, et cetera. So they might just sit him today um, and give give Lugo a little bit of opportunity to run here. So uh, some Padres, some Lugo for sure. I'm probably just going to leave most of the Angels on the shelf outside of like a Mickey Moniak um, or Ono Tani if he does start. Okay, let's move on to Seattle and San Francisco. Tommy Malone, as we mentioned at the outset, probably going to be him. He's 4,000, but I don't think you can play him. We have upside concerns. He doesn't strike anybody out. He's always been a low strikeout guy. He's just a, a spot starter for them whenever they need an arm. Um, and, you know, he's serviceable. He's had some walk problems in the last couple of seasons. He's he's getting up there in age. He's been out been around for a really long time. This is an okay matchup for him to just kind of survive, give up three runs, go four or five innings or something, and just, you know, eat a little bit of uh, production for them. Do I want to play the Giants necessarily? I mean, you can play some of these guys. I think this is fine, but, you know, we've still got to keep in mind this is a night game in San Francisco at 60 degrees. Now, they did move up the start time a little bit, curiously, probably for a fireworks show or something like that. Um, they are starting at 9 Eastern here instead of their typical 10 Eastern uh, in San Francisco. And there's a little bit of wind, so you might be able to capitalize on some offense. That's a bit of a bunch, bump for offense there. Not huge, but it's you know it's not zero. So you can play a couple of these Giants bats, I think. Austin Slater, Wilmer Flores, and J.D. Davis going to pop really hard in value, definitely, as will Paddy Bailey behind the plate. Um Maybe a Luis Matos from the right side. You can go after Tommy Malone. He's got a traditional right-handed split where he's far more susceptible to the righties. So you can get to an Austin Slater, 31. I like that price tag. And Wilmer at 25 for sure. Um, probably just a short stack here. The Giants, I think, going after Tommy Malone. Don't generally like full stacks in on full 11 gamers uh, with the Giants at home. But a playable spot for sure. Um, if you want to, you know, play a Patty Bailey behind the plate, J.D. Davis, Wilmer Flores type, something like that. I think that's very much in play. Alex Cobb on the mound, I think he's very much in play too. Uh, I think Seattle just stinks, man. Um, it, this offense is super attackable. I really don't know how they have a 99 WRC+. plus. I don't know where they're creating runs because they strike out a lot. They don't hit for a hell of a lot of power. This is about an average number, average hard contact, average batted ball profile, and they pop up a lot of balls. You know, they are overall very unimpressive. They strike out, and situational at-bats for them are pretty underwhelming. Um, you know, this isn't like a positive ballpark shift for him or anything like that, you know, getting into San Francisco. And so I'm fine playing Alex Cobb. He's got a lot of ground balls here. He's got elite strikeout stuff against the right side. And they're probably only going to have three lefties in the lineup here. JP, Cal, Raleigh, or maybe four with uh, Jared Kelnick and Mike Ford down at the bottom. Um, but, but are we really scared of a, a Mike Ford down in the eight hole necessarily? I mean, I don't know. A couple of these guys are going to be able to get the baseball in the air like a Cal Raleigh, Jared Kelnick or something like that. That puts them in play at playable price tags. Uh, JP at the top of the lineup because he's not going to you know, swing and miss or anything like that. Just a 13% K rate against lefties for Alex Cobb this year. And he'll give up a little bit of batting average there. Still a lot of ground balls, though, however. Um, I think with a an elevated line drive rate at 23% and some a little bit hard to the left-handers, 33%, I think that puts JP in play with, like, a, a short stack of uh, JP, Cal Raleigh, and, I don't know, maybe a Julio, I guess. Uh, but Alex caught, like, I don't want to play Teoscar. He's going to swing and, and miss a crap load. Doesn't give up barrels, does Cobb. And that's really how you need to go after um, pitchers with Teoscar Hernandez. So no thanks there. Same thing with any of the other righties. Julio, I'm not super thrilled about a 4,900 in this matchup necessarily. Um, he strikes out too. So, eh, you know, I'd rather just get to Cobb. I think at 8,600 in this range, Lugo and Cobb are very much in play, as is Lance Lynn. So super interesting mid-range here today. Um, I think Cobb is very much in play. He'd probably be my favorite. He's so efficient early in the count. Has really good chase here with the splitter. Doesn't induce a lot of swing and miss, but he's still got it against the right side with the splitter curveball. Um, you know, aggregate swing and miss rate. 
you know, swing strike rate, I should say, at 9% is not impressive, but that's mostly because he doesn't induce anything to the lefties. So with such a right-handed heavy lineup here and the Mariners playing in San Francisco, I mean, I think Alex Cobb is fine at 8,600. I think there's 25 in him, uh, and that could be all you need here as an SP2. Um, okay, let's move on to the Mets and Arizona. Uh, Kodai Senga, we talked about this yesterday, but thanks to uh, Buck Showalter's clown circus act over here, um, he went with Scherzer, and evidently that was the plan for them all along, and they just decided not to announce it to anybody. Um, in any case, uh, it's Kodai Senga today against the Diamondbacks. I'm not going to go super deep into this because I, I ran it about it yesterday. It's a pitch count, and it's the walks. I'm not doing this against a good offense over here. This team is actually leading the NL West. Um, so I'm not I'm not playing Kodai Senga. Now, I do like the ownership. It's about four or five ticks lower than it was projecting for yesterday. Um, but at 10000 he's actually you know 100 cheaper as well. I still don't want to deal with this. I'd much rather play Pablo Lopez, of course, uh, even at three and a half and four times the ownership. And I'd much rather play Justin Steele. I, I don't think either of those guys have near the downside that Kodai Senga does. Uh, he just can't run deep enough into a game at this price tag, so I'm not dealing with it. Against this offense, I don't really want to play them necessarily uh, because they're super expensive, so it's hard to stack. You know, they're in play because he walks everybody, he does Senga. Ketel Marte, though, at 58, Corbin Carroll at 6,000, Christian Walker at 54, and Lourdes at 48. I mean, that's hard to get to. I'd like to make it cheaper with Jerry Perdomo at the top at shortstop. I think he's a pretty decent shortstop play at 4,000. Evan Longoria... Um, is fine. Alec Thomas will make it cheap down at the bottom. That's fine. Uh, so if you get to full Arizona stacks, they're very capable of picking apart somebody that has a walk problem. Um, so that's fine if you can make that happen. They're way down the board for me, I think. Um, you know, similar to like a, a Texas or something, just due to the price tags. You know, I really like the offense. I like the upside that they offer. Um, and I think the spot is okay. But it, it's hard to squeeze them in when you've got Atlanta uh, that you really want to play, and the Dodgers, who we'll get to. Um, so I'm just going to leave Senga on the shelf for the most part. Maybe I'll have a couple of teams again, you know, like I mentioned yesterday, but uh, it's not going to be a lot of them, and I'm not going to be happy about it. Uh, Tommy Henry going for the D-backs. Now, he's been good and a little bit better, despite the fact that he pitches to a good bit of contact, 78% here, and doesn't throw it past anybody, 17% raw strikeout rate. I, he's been better, and I think that start against Colorado really gave him a lot of confidence about a month and a half ago. Um, he's been serviceable ever since then. Now, he's been you know picked apart a couple of times, of course. He got beat up pretty good in that start following that Colorado start against Washington and by Philly as well. But he was serviceable against Cleveland in a really tough matchup, went a full six innings, didn't strike out anybody, and gave up a couple runs, but you know still went six. Six and two-thirds again in his second start against Washington, where he went seven, struck... Uh, six and two-thirds, sprayed seven hits, rather, struck out five, gave up just one run, and then was excellent in his last start against the Angels, where he went five and two-thirds, struck out eight. So I think he's starting to figure it out a little bit. At 7,000, he's a playable SP2 down in this range. Um, are you really thrilled about anybody down here? Uh, not necessarily. I don't think you would have to go down here, uh, but he would be one of them that I could consider going after the Mets. I don't really want to play Ashcraft necessarily in a super bad strikeout matchup with just two pitches. Tommy Henry's at least got four, and this is a pretty bad strikeout matchup, of course. But Arizona does play a little bit more pitcher-friendly with the humidor down there. Um, against the Mets, you know, this offense is just pretty average. So I think both of those guys are in play, Henry and Graham Ashcraft, in this, you know, 6-7K to 7K range. You can go after the Mets, even though they're not going to whiff a hell of a lot. They hit a lot of ground balls. And unfortunately for Tommy Henry, this is why I'm a little wary of getting a good bit of exposure here. You don't need a lot. He, I mean, he's 1% owned here. I think this is okay, to be quite honest. Um, I'm a little bit worried because he is a fly ball lean here. Um, with the four-seamer slider curveball change, that gives him a little bit of a fly ball lean. Not super attackable necessarily with right-handers in the opposite side of the platoon. Just 250 average, 185 ISO. You know, these are roughly league average numbers for a guy that only strikes out 70%. Against the lefties, gives up a little bit more pop in a shorter sample. 
I mean, it, it, it's not going to wow you or anything down here, but 1% ownership so far, I think that has to put him in play against a pretty average and, and very mediocre offense. You want to play some of these guys from the Mets? Yeah, sure. Tommy Pham is fine at 32. Pete Alonso, of course, at 52. Charlie Marte, fine. These guys will hit some ground balls, and batted ball-wise, that does play into them, you know, their strengths a little bit. So I think that's fine in that respect, but I do think that Tommy Henry kind of has to be in play here. He's got some good chase and a sneaky high for somebody that only strikes out 17% of guys. CSW here at 26%. 11% swing strike rate. We need a little bit more at him, but he's still a young arm and still developing. I think he's getting a little bit more confidence having been able to run deeper into games um, a little bit more recently. So I think he's in play at 7,000. Not going to wow you, but you only need 5, 6, 8% or something to get a hell of a lot of leverage on the field. And you only need one tournament, uh, or one team, rather, to get you there in a tournament with uh, that kind of leverage on the field on a super ignored starting pitcher. So I, I think that puts him in play. Uh, no Sanga, very little of the Mets. Um, you know, one-offs here or there. Frankie Lindor, yeah, sure, you can play him too. Uh, and some D-backs, if I can make it happen against the Mets. I think there could be sneaky offense, you know, because there could be a lot of contact from Tommy Henry still, and Kodai Sanga walks everyone. So it's in play there in tournaments. Um, not overly thrilled about it, but, uh, you know, it's not totally off the board necessarily. All right, going long here, so let's get to the last game. Osvaldo Beto on the mound for the Pirates. Uh, this is a total non-starter. I'm not playing him in the 7K range, 7,400. He has a 20% strikeout rate. Doesn't walk a lot of guys, but he's got a 6% swinging strike rate, sub-60% swipe strike one, and only a 25% chase rate. So against the Dodgers, we're not dealing with this. He's got a bad fastball, a bad four-seamer, that is. Gives up all of the, the value that he gets on the two-seamer right back with the four-seamer. So he's dead neutral in value on the fastball mix. And he's got a dead break-even slider. Fine change-up. Okay, that's great. He might be able to induce a little bit of whiffs uh, or swing and miss um, from a couple of these lefties, notably a Max Muncy who strikes out a crap load. Um, but... Like, who else is, are you going to strike out here from the left side? It's not going to be Mookie, uh, of of course, you know, because he's a right-hander. Uh, and you've only got 17% strikeouts to the righties. But it's not going to be Freddie from the left side. Probably not going to be David Peralta or Jason Hayward necessarily either. And, and, like, maybe James Outman starting to heat up again, who hit two jacks yesterday. So I don't want to deal with this with Beto. I want to play the Dodgers. It's them and Atlanta as the top two stacks here today. And I would not be surprised if the Dodgers really put up a crooked number here soon. Um, you know, they did it a couple of times at Coors or whatever, but that's Coors Field. It did, They really haven't done it uh, in a while here um, where they just put up a 10 spot and they hit six bombs or something. Um, this could very well be that night here. He doesn't have a huge barrel rate, does Beto yet, in his four starts. And they've been pretty serviceable for the most part. Um you know, his last outing against Milwaukee, he got really beat up, gave up four runs, didn't throw it past anybody in three and a third. And he'd been kind of downtrending a little bit. Um, you know, he got two starts against the Cubs. Cubs are you know below average against right-handed pitching. Then he got Miami, where he got picked apart a little bit there. Uh, and then that last start against Milwaukee, where he, he gave up a lot of production. This is not a good spot to look for a, a bounce the other way against the Dodgers. So let's play every one of them. Um, outside of Miggy Rojas, because I don't like the price tag of 2900 but everybody else is in play. Bobby Miller on the mound for them. He's going to see some ownership, too, and I want to play him again. You know, I played him in his last start at, I believe, 8900 and he was serviceable. He was okay against, against the Royals, did give up three runs, and only struck out four. Um, so we might have a little bit of concern there, because he, he throws super, super hard, right? He's got 100 in the tank, but it's mostly a two-seamer, and that's not a swing and miss pitch. So he's similar to Dustin May, who is unfortunately out for the rest of the season. Um, in that he just, with this pitch, it's just not a swing and miss pitch. So we might struggle sometimes to get some real raw upside in terms of the strikeouts from him. And they're going to have some lefties over here, notably Brian Reynolds, Carlos Santana, Jack Sawinski from the left side of the plate. Um, you know, maybe a Tuki Marcano or whatever. That could make some contact on this particular pitch, right, of the two-seamer. But he's got a decent changeup as well, and he can induce a little bit of swing and miss to the left side. Uh, that's mostly the change going to work and a little bit of the curveball. Unfortunately, he just doesn't have any 
swing and miss to the right side. And that's where we really need to see this develop to get super jacked about playing a lot of Bobby Miller going forward. But he's a very young arm. Um, this will develop. And it's a super high projection, great value score so far, and very playable ownership. So um, I don't have any problems eating a Pablo and a Bobby Miller team or something like that today. I think these matchups are fine. Pittsburgh's still going to go pretty right-handed heavy here with some strikeouts in there. Um you know, from like a, a Henry Davis, Nick Gonzalez types. It, and down at the bottom of the lineup, either catcher they've got in there or whatever they do in the outfield um, or in the middle infield. Uh, who knows? With like a, a Jared Triolo that they just called up, for example. You know, there's some swing and miss down here because Bobby Miller's got velocity and it's a good suppression spot for him. He's very likely to get run support. So even if he doesn't strike out a lot of guys, you get a little bit of a bump in that respect because he could go you know, five, six innings here and, you know, strike out three guys, but get a win out of it. Um, you know, and that puts you at roughly a K an inning uh, type of value. So I think that's that's in play for Bobby Miller here tonight. So no Pirates outside of my usual, um, you know, Jack Sawinski types. You can play some Brian Reynolds because Brian, Bobby Miller is going to be popular here. And Brian Reynolds is a very good hitter. And he's getting a ballpark bump a little bit here into... Dodger Stadium and Chavez Ravine. So that's very much playable at 5,000, as is Carlos Santana. He's been fantastic recently. Interesting sort of late slate type of play there um, at 3,000 at first base, if you want to get onto that. Harder on the main slate, of course. So maybe just a couple of, of lefty power bats here, maybe a right-hander like a Kutch um, or a Henry Davis one-off type because of the reduced strikeout rate against Bobby Miller, but uh, or for Bobby Miller against right-handers, but overall not super thrilled about the Pirates here. Probably just going to leave them on the shelf for the most part. Okay, we are done here. I think we are uh, going pretty long. Let's review pretty quickly. Baltimore and the Yankees, offense only for me here. No Randy Vasquez, definitely no Dean Kramer. I think the Yankees are a very intriguing stack. Um, I'd probably like to get to mostly the lefties. Anthony Rizzo, a pretty damn good play, I think. Cincinnati and Washington, I'm going to leave pitching for the most part on the shelf here. Uh, no JoJo for me against a really dangerous lineup. Intriguing stack for Cincinnati here. If you can make this happen, um, popping despite very expensive price tags in value here so far, things will change throughout the day, but intriguing for sure. Graham Mashcraft is in play at 6,100 if you need to get all the way down here. Atlanta and, and Cleveland, Atlanta and, and the Dodgers, they're the top two stacks here. Mike Soroka, one of the cheaper arms that is in a fine suppression matchup, similar to Graham Ashcraft here against Cleveland. No Cal Quantrill whatsoever. I'm not going anywhere near this. You can play Atlanta, play all of them if you can make it happen, but it, it's kind of gross at their particular price tags. Uh, Texas, Boston, same thing with Texas here. They're very expensive as well, going after Brian Bayo. I'd be much less inclined to go after Brian Bayo. I respect him quite a bit more than Cal Quantrill, certainly, and certainly more than Osvaldo Bito as well. Um, because Brian Bayo gets ground balls here. Price adjusted, it's got to be, oh, I don't know, like a Nate Lowe, 4,600. From the left side, Corey Seager at 6,200. He's always my favorite. Um, so they're playable here. I'm less on Texas full stacks today than I am usually, but this game's in Fenway, and uh, you can definitely get there, even though I do respect Brian Bayo and the ground ball stuff. Um, and Boston, too. You can go after John Gray. I'm going to leave him on the shelf. I think he's overpriced for this particular matchup, and there's other guys in this range I'd rather play today than John. KC and the um, Twins, rather. Royals, nothing for me today, including Alec Marsh against the Twins. Um now, Twins aren't going to be as popular as they were yesterday. Unfortunately, they got there yesterday. Unfortunately for those that played Granky like me. Um, but I think you can get right back to him. Eddie Julian, Alex Kirilov, Max Kepler from the left side. You can play Buxton, too. He's 54. It's fine. Carlos Correa is 46. It's it's fine here. Josie Miranda as well, 32. That also fine. Might be my favorite play. Uh, well, it's definitely Eddie Julian. But it could be Joey Gallo down at the bottom of the lineup. I like that at 3,300. And a lot of Pablo Lopez, as much as I can get. Toronto and the White Sox, interesting tournament game here. Uh, Lance Lynn and Josie Barrios both in play for sure at, the, at their respective price tags. Tough matchup for Lance Lynn, of course, um, against Toronto. And Toronto is very much in play in a sneaky stack here against Lance Lynn. I really like some lefties. Brandon Belt, pretty good play there. Chicago and Milwaukee. Justin Steele very much so in play against Pablo or as a pivot off of Pablo Lopez against Milwaukee because Milwaukee is dreadful. They strike out a lot 
And even though he's got a reduced strikeout stuff to the right side, he's got a fantastic cutter. He's going to be able to induce a lot of soft contact here. No Adrian Hauser for me. Um, he just pitches to too much contact. He's got elite ground balls against the right side. That could keep him in play, but he's got drastic splits against lefties. So I want to get to some lefties here, in particular Mike Talkman, Ian Happ, and a Cody Bellinger. I like those plays a good bit. Angel San Diego, no Patty Sandoval for me here tonight at 6,900. Rather play like a Seth Lugo at 7,900 um, on the other side. If Otani is out, I think Seth Lugo is very much in play, and he would climb up the board pretty quickly for me, I think, uh, with Trout and um, Brandon Drury. Brandon Drury's been out for a little while, but uh, Anthony Rendon is the name I was searching for there. Also likely to be out. Padres, sure, but I generally don't like going after Patty unless it's with uh, really high line drive and fly ball hitters. Um, that's mostly like a Manny Machado, the Tatis, and a Bogarts types. Hassan Kim is a high contact bat. You could throw him into a short stack if you'd like. Seattle and San Francisco, no pitching uh, for Seattle. Definitely not Tommy Malone here, um, even though he is 4,000. Just have upside concerns even at that price. Alex Cobb, I really like, though, uh, on the other side. 8,600. I think there's some upside that's not priced in here that we can go after Seattle with. Um, maybe a couple short pieces of San Francisco. No Seattle for me here tonight, outside of maybe a, uh, you know, J.P. Crawford, Cal Raleigh, Jared Kelnick type of play here or there, but not super thrilling, I don't think. Mets, Arizona. Mets are in play a little bit because Tommy Henry doesn't strike out anybody, um, but I think he's in play, too. It's 7K somewhere in this range if you need to land on this. I don't think this is a total, like, X amount of the pool type of play here tonight, or type of approach here tonight. Um, I'm probably not going to X Kodai Senga, but I would really like to, to be quite honest. Uh, he's in play at the low ownership because he has strikeout upside. But this is a bad matchup once again. I don't really want to stack Arizona necessarily, but you can because he walks everybody. So go ahead. No Pittsburgh for me tonight outside of some one-offs against Bobby Miller. I'd like to get to a good bit of Bobby Miller and all of the Dodgers, uh, every single one of them outside of Miggy Rojas. So that's it. We are done here. Um, once again, keep an eye out for projections and ownership updates. Things will change throughout the day as we push updates as often as possible. Good luck to everybody on this large Wednesday 11-gamer.